Tonight, we are going to be in Philippians chapter 2, continuing uh, from last week, looking at this idea of humility. And what we're going to be talking about tonight specifically is the example of Christ's humility. The example that he gives us as we see his humility in heaven, as we're going to see his humility in his incarnation, and as we see his humility in his death. And the point of all this and the encouragement tonight is that is, is it, it is an example to us to follow in achieving what was Paul's command that we looked at last week in chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, when Paul said, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also the interests of others. So join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for tonight. We pray, God, that you would speak to us and bless us through this study tonight as we get into your word and really see your heart, see your example, see who you were and how you lived and what you did and how that is supposed to apply in our lives as believers, as Christians, Lord, as we endeavor to follow you in this world, to be examples of you in this world, and Lord, to live the things that you are teaching us to live, God, according to what you intended us to, to be living those things by, Lord. And so, God, that's why we get into your word. That's why we study, and we pray, God, that you would speak to us tonight. Lord, I pray for specifically anybody in this room tonight that does not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, God, that your spirit would begin to speak to them even now, Lord, and that tonight as they're given an opportunity to receive you as their Savior, to receive the forgiveness of sins that you've offered them, Lord, that you would begin to peel away the, the barriers and the things that would inhibit them from exercising their free will, to come to you and say, God, please forgive me of my sins. Lord, we thank you. We love you so much for everything you've done and everything you're doing and everything you're going to do in our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, I want to start tonight with an actual story from Matthew chapter 20. Um, you don't have to turn there, but if you want to take notes for that. The way this story goes is this was towards the end of the ministry of Jesus Christ here on the earth. And what had happened is there was a very ugly competitive spirit that had been developing between a couple of Jesus' uh, disciples, his followers, specifically between James and John. And this, this competitive spirit that was developing led to them having their mom go to Jesus and say, Hey, Jesus. Can you make sure that uh, my boys James and John like get the, 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 the fancy thrones in heaven? Can they get the privileged position in heaven? Because, you know, that would be really great. And, of course, I'm a mom asking, and, right, you got to do what mom says, right? Um, well, when the other apostles heard about this, uh, they weren't real happy with James and John. And harsh words began, and I'm sure there was, you know, some angry gestures exchanged among the twelve as they were working through this. And so Jesus called them together, and in Matthew chapter 20, verse 25, it says that Jesus called them over and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in high positions act as tyrants over them. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Now hearing that, I think when we all look at that, it's, it's kind of hard to miss the point, right? I mean, it's pretty clear what he was saying, but I think we all also understand that hearing the truth and making it a part of our lives are not the same thing. A lot of times we hear truth and we think, oh, I heard it, therefore, but if we don't make it a part of our lives, it's not having the effect it's wanting to have, especially among those devoted to Christ. We struggle with this concept sometimes. So to continue the story, several days later, the apostles and Jesus arrive in Jerusalem for the Passover. And the arguing was still going on, and the, this, this just competitive spirit was still going on. Well, Peter and John were, were tasked with going to secure an upper room for them to gather together to celebrate the Passover feast. Now, what they failed to do was to secure someone to do foot washing. Like in those days, they didn't have fancy Jordans and all that kind of stuff. It was often sandals or barefoot, depending on who you were. And so feet were filthy, because getting from place to place was often by foot. If you were rich enough or, or of means enough, maybe you had a horse or a camel or something. But the point was, is when people gathered together, there was a common thing that would happen that there would be someone there to wash the feet because feet were filthy. Well, unfortunately, Peter and John didn't secure anybody to do the foot washing. And uh, as they all gathered together in the upper room for this uh, Passover meal, uh, nobody volunteered to, to do the foot washing. 
You know, and you can imagine them falling in and looking around, and maybe they look over to the station where the foot washing stuff is, and oh, no one's there. Well, maybe Andrew will do it. Well, oh, and Andrew walks in. Oh, maybe, maybe James will do it. But the point was, is nobody volunteered to do the foot washing. And um, as you go through the story, uh, you, you, you see that Jesus' teaching from Matthew 20 obviously had no effect on their lives. Not a single one of them volunteered to do the foot washing, to, to wash everybody's feet. So very human of them, and uh, so very like many of us so often. And so John's gospel relates what happens during this Last Supper behind the closed doors. And uh, what happens is the disciples were there gathered around the table, and they were all reclining at the table. It wasn't like chairs and stuff. It was pillows, and they would just kind of all chill on the ground and recline up against the table and eat, and that's how they celebrated. And so they're all reclined around their table, and their gross, nasty feet sticking out behind them as they're laying there just enjoying the time. And uh, uh, the meal was already in progress. And the conversation, I would imagine, was, was, was... Uh, difficult, and there was tension in the air because, again, there was this competitive thing still going on amongst them of who was going to be the greatest and who was going to be on top. And, you know, you can imagine what a, what a pleasant Passover meal, right? And so they're all sitting there, and they're all talking, and then they become aware. Just very silently, very quietly, Jesus, their teacher, their master, had gotten up from the table, and he himself went and stood apart from them and went over to where the, the foot washing stuff was and it tells us in uh, John chapter, uh, I believe it's 13, that uh, he removes his outer garment and then he takes the, the slave's towel and he wraps it around himself and girds himself. And then he pours the water into a basin and then he begins to slowly proceed around the circle of disciples, washing their feet one at a time. Wiping them off with the towel, just, just a tender moment. Pretty breathtaking moment, as you can imagine. And uh, uh, for the disciples specifically, just what is he doing? Because according to Jewish teaching, um, no Hebrew, no Jewish person, even a Jewish slave could be commanded to wash feet. That was the lowest of the lowest of the disgusting, of the despicable things somebody could do. I think I mentioned it last week that other slaves would look at the slaves who had to wash feet and go, dang, you got it bad. Because it was so just demeaning. It was considered such a demeaning thing. And yet here we are having Jesus washing their feet in the most humble way possible, clothed in the towel of a servant. And so in the silence of the room, you just, you just put yourself in the mind of these disciples. They just hear the trickle of the water as it's being poured into the basin and you know, the, the friction of the towel. As, as it's wiping off their feet, as Jesus is cleaning their feet, and just the sound of their master just breathing, just as he goes from one person to the other, washing their disgusting feet. The incarnate Son, God himself, dressed like a servant, washing the feet of his prideful, arrogant creations. And then he said in John chapter 13, verse 14, Jesus says, So if I, your Lord and teacher have washed your feet. You also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do just as I have done for you. Truly I tell you, a servant is not greater than his master, and a messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. And so in this story, Jesus is applying a, a real ancient logic here. The, the logic is this. If it's true for the greater which was Christ, God himself, then it must also be true for the lesser, you the disciples, or us the followers of Christ. If he did it, we should do it. If he took it upon himself, we should take it upon ourselves. Why? Because he's God. He's perfect, peerless, holy, righteous God. And if he would lower himself to do something like that, how much more so should we, his followers? Now, what would be the worst possible humiliation for you? What act, what job, what thing in, in your own mind would you go, man, that would be the most humiliating, most degrading, most, most demeaning possible thing I could do? Whatever that thing is in your mind, this is what foot washing was, and probably worse. Now, given our natural bent to be self-centered, I believe it's always been difficult for all of us, myself included, to live out 
Christ's instructions as advised by Paul in Philippians chapter 2. Now last week we looked at the, those verses 3 and 4 where he said, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. Consider others as more important than yourselves. Look out not only for your own interests, but also the interest of others. Humility and other directedness, is, it's hard for us. It doesn't come natural to our being and who we are. And it's especially hard for us, it seems, in our most cherished relationships, right? How many of you have ever experienced that moment where, where it's easier to be kind and cordial to a complete stranger than it is to the person you love the most? Right? It's almost this weird thing we have where it's like, oh, it's a stranger. I, I've got to be nice. But then we're nasty to the people that are closest to us. We're mean. We're, we're hurtful. It, and why is that? Well, I believe it's because we're selfish, sinful people. And Paul, in Philippians chapter 2, is calling the Christians, calling the Philippians there and us today, to live lives worthy of the gospel. And so what Paul does here in verses 5 through 11 is he turns to the example of Christ which, which verses 5 through 11 really are the theological centerpiece of this entire letter to the Philippians. We're going to look at verses 5 through 8 tonight and, and see really Christ's perfect and ultimate example of humbling himself. We're going to see the example of what, when Paul is saying, look, esteem others better than yourself. Humble yourself. Think of others' needs first. What that picture looks like in the ultimate example of Christ. And again, we're going to see that in his humility in heaven. We're going to see that in his humility in his incarnation and his humility in his death. And then next week, we're going to look at his exaltation. When we look at one of the most famous verses, I think, in the Bible, when it says, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess the Lord. But read with me tonight, verses 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now this is an important section of scripture to memorize because it is the very example God's given us of how do we live humbly as his people. So let's unpack this, starting in verse 5. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What that simply means is have the same attitude among yourselves that Christ Jesus had. Now when he says, let this mind be in you, that word means not just internally. He's not just saying, hey, individual, just have this internal attitude that Jesus had. No, the word in the Greek literally means among yourselves. That as you interact together as the church, have the same attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Paul's not concerned with just our internal thinking and how we perceive and view ourselves in the situations. He's concerned with how we live out our attitude as Christians, how we live out our attitude of humility. And so verse 6, we see the first thing in Christ's humility in heaven. Paul says, Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. See, this is a glimpse of before time. This is a glimpse of before God the Son came to this earth as Jesus Christ. It says, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. What does that mean there? Well, we see Christ's humility in his very existence. One, he was in the form of God, okay? Now, what does that mean? Are we talking about the shape of God? You know, he had two arms and two legs and a beard. Was that the form of God? Did he have long brown hair or short brown hair? You know, the, the artistic representations of Christ have gone all across the board. People have made artistic representations of Christ of every race, of every nationality, of every look. And, 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 and that always cracks me up. Because the Bible is very clear. We don't know what he looked like. And nobody really knew. Because he was so plain, it didn't stick in anybody's mind. He was so unremarkable in his physical form. That, that he wasn't anybody that would stand out in a crowd. But that's not what's being referred to here when it says the form of God. When he says that he was in the form of God, he's referring to the, the attributes of God, the, the characteristics of God. What he's saying here is that all the inward attributes of God were expressed outwardly in who Jesus was. 
God's power, God's glory, his majesty, his authority, his love, his patience, his compassion. You know, when you see a, see a golfer and you go, wow, that golfer has great form. Are you saying, wow, he's shaped like a golfer? No. What you're saying is he's displaying the attributes of a great golfer. And that's what you mean when you say, wow, that golfer has great form. What Paul is saying here to us is as we're looking at examples, Christ, what is your example of humility, all right? God, how do you want me to live? He's starting out here with saying something very important. The greatest way to understand who God is is to look at Jesus. That's it. The greatest way to understand. The way Jesus spoke is how God the Father would speak. The way Jesus acted is how the Father would act. If you saw Jesus serving and loving, you were watching the Father serve and love. If you saw Jesus being generous, you were watching the Father be generous. Seeing and watching Christ is how you knew who God is. And it's the same today. That's why studying your Bible is so critical. Studying the life of Christ is how we see who God is and what he's like and what he wants. And this, this doctrine, this theology, if you will, um, that Jesus is not just an angel, all right? He's not half God and half man. He's not the brother of Michael the archangel. He's not Michael the archangel himself. He's not Lucifer's brother. All, no, the doctrine that the Bible teaches is very clear that Jesus Christ is God. He is fully God and fully man at the same time. He is God fully in, in his divinity incarnated here on earth. Nothing subtracted from his deity, simply having humanity added to his deity, and it's seen all over Scripture. That if we want the example of who God is as the perfect example of how to live, look at Christ. Study Christ. In John 14, Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Is that unclear in any way? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. In John chapter 8, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Now what he was doing there to the crowd he was talking to was evoking the name of Yahweh. The name of God. You see, back in the Old Testament, when Moses came up to the burning bush, and he was like, who's, who's talking to me? God said from the burning bush, I am that I am. God's name was I am. Eternally existent. Not I will be, not I was, I am. That was how God identified himself. And that word Yahweh, that, that word that is translated Lord in our scriptures, was a critically important identifier. And anybody that, that said, I am Yahweh, or, or used this phrase, I am, was saying, I am God. And so when Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, he was telling the crowd that he was talking to that I am God. Now, if you read that story in John 8, you can almost feel the people getting like, can, can he say that? I mean, you know, because the, the, the penalty of that was to be stoned to death. And in the story, it says the people started picking up stones to stone him. But Jesus had no problem saying it. He didn't shy away from it. And he said it multiple times and made this, this declaration often throughout Scripture that he is God. Not a God. He is God himself. And then in John chapter 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14 of John 1, it says, Then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word that was God and was with God, Jesus Christ, became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was God. He is God. And he will forever be God. Eternally existing as one part of the Trinity, with God the Father and God the Spirit. Now, we don't have time to get into a whole teaching on the Trinity, but the Bible is very clear that the Trinity exists. You have God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Separate, distinct beings, yet equally and at the same time, simultaneously, God. Now, if we do a Q&A next week and you go explain the Trinity, I'm probably not going to answer that question. Not because I don't know the answer, but yeah, because I don't know the answer. It's one of those things that the Bible very clearly teaches in both directions. And how it reconciles together, I don't know. It really is something that is in the, the, the domain of God that is beyond my comprehension. 
But the Bible is very clear that it teaches that there is a trinity that exists as one God, Jesus being one part of that trinity. And he said he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now you might read that in the New King James and you go, what does he mean by consider it robbery to be equal with God? Was he saying, I'm equal with God and I don't consider that robbery? That's how it reads in the New King James. But that's not the best rendering of it. A better rendering of that thing that says, he did not consider equality with God something to be exploited. And this is where we see the humility of Christ in heaven before all things. That as one third of the Trinity, he didn't consider his Godhead to be something to be exploited there or exploited when he came to this earth. And that's a very important thing when we look at the humility of Jesus Christ. See, Colossians 1.16 says, For everything was created by him, speaking of Jesus, in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers of authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. If anybody had the right ever to claim position and to claim rights and to claim whatever, it was Jesus. He had the right, but he did not exploit his position in the Godhead when he came to this earth. He didn't exploit his position to avoid the plan of redemption that God had created from the beginning of all time. I mean, talk about what Paul said, right? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility considers others as more important than yourself. That God, who created this entire universe, considered you and I important enough to come and and, and, and wrap himself into humanity, to be born as a man, to live a life, and to die our death on the cross so that we could be saved? Yeah, if that's not putting others as more important than yourself, I don't know what is. Can you imagine if you and I were the ones that created everything in the universe? What would our attitude be if we were the ones that created everything? Well, I think it would be like this video clip right here. Yes! Look what I have created! I have made fire! I have made fire! That would have been us if we created all things in the universe. Hey, star, guess what I did? I made that star over there. Pretty cool, huh? Hey, let me go around and just brag about what I've done because I'm so great and I've accomplished so many things. But that's not the example we have in Christ. We don't have stories in the Bible where we see Jesus going, hey, Holy Spirit, guess what I did? I made earth. (laughs) Right? No mic drops from Jesus, boom, done, look at me. None of that. We don't see any of that in Christ's example. And then verse 7, we see his humility in the incarnation. Chapter 2, verse 7, it says, But he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Instead of exploiting his divinity, instead of demanding rights, instead of coming to this earth and going, look, I'm the creator of all things. You guys should bow down to me. I'm the creator of all things. You guys should worship me. It says that he made himself of no reputation. That also means that he emptied himself. Other translations say that he made himself nothing. He emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant. Instead of coming down and saying, look, I deserve to be king. I deserve to rule this world. After all, I'm God, so I demand that you obey me. I demand that you do what I say no matter what. Instead of doing all of that stuff, he set aside his divinity. He didn't do away with it. He didn't become not God. What he did is he became a slave in service to mankind as God. He devoted himself to us in disregard of his own interests. He didn't consider what he did or didn't deserve as God, as the creator, but he did what was ever in our best interest. That's what it means when it says he took the form of a bondservant. A bondservant was somebody who was once um, in the culture was a slave, and then they earned their freedom, and then that person said, you know what, I want to come back and serve voluntarily. That's what a bondservant was, was a voluntary slave. And God himself voluntarily came down, made himself of no reputation, and took the form of a bondservant to voluntarily serve us. And that was the example we saw in his foot washing. That he got up of his own decision and put on the towel and got the water and went and did the most demeaning, disgusting job possible washing their feet. 
And then when it says that he came in the likeness of men, that's talking about him being born as a human. That God himself, who is omnipotent and almighty and all-knowing and, and, and just beyond and outside of creation because he created it, came within creation and clothed himself, was born in humanity. Jesus with skin, as some people have said it. Or God with skin, sorry. Jesus is God with skin. He became mankind. He was born as a baby and grew the Bible says, in stature as men do. He wasn't born as a baby and, and came out of the womb and he's like, wow, this is interesting. I am fully cognizant of who I am as God and I'm a little, no, he was a baby and he had to learn. He, he put himself within those restraints to learn, as grow, to learn and grow as a man, to experience what we experience, to go through the things we experience. He felt fear, he felt worry, he felt sadness, he felt happiness, he felt joy, hunger, thirst, anger, betrayal. He experienced all of it, and the Bible tells us that he went through all of that so that he could identify with us, so that no human in all of history can ever say, he doesn't get it. He doesn't understand what I'm going through. He doesn't understand whatever my situation is. Hebrews is the book that teaches us that he knows and he gets it and he understands and he did that specifically so that he can say, I identify with you. I identify with the struggle. I identify with the challenges. I identify with the temptations. I identify with the, with the, the struggle of, of, of following God. But you know what? I gave you the example of doing it perfectly without mistake, without anything. But he doesn't boast about that. He doesn't go around and say, look at me, look at me. He just came and did it and lived, and then going on to die for us. The mere fact that God himself, the creator of all things, the creator of you and me, descended all the way down to this little ball of dirt called earth, constrained his glory and his majesty and, and all his mightiness into the form of a human, is something that should boggle our minds continuously. We should just be like, no way, I don't understand. Like, how is, why would he do that? And even as believers, we should just be blown away by that reality at all times and all ways because the humility it took to be the creator of everything and to say, okay, now I'm going to come down into the form of a man and live and die for these, these people. The humility that that took. Christ didn't just become humble. He was always humble. He is humility. He didn't learn it. He is it. He is the origin and the ultimate expression of humility. But he didn't stop there. Verse 8, we see his descent continuing right into death. And being found in the appearance of a man, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now I want you to notice something, and you could highlight this if you're a highlighter or circle or underline. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself. Okay, Christ, as a real, fully human man, while simultaneously fully God humbled himself. He was not humbled. He humbled himself. There was no external thing that, that humbled him or forced him into to, to this humble position. He chose it. At every level of his humbling, it was all his own doing. His not holding tightly to, to his rights and his divinity and his equality with God. No, I'm part of the Godhead. I ain't going to that earth to die for them. Pfft. He didn't do that. He chose to come. His emptying of himself, him making himself a nobody, not being born on this earth as a, as a king or as a leader or somebody to be, no, but, but a nobody. His becoming a servant to all of us in body and soul, his full embrace and, and, and entrance into humanity, all of it by his own doing and by his own choice. And this message is for all of us to, to it's a message to prove to us that any, anybody that has selfish ambition or pride, anybody that thinks too much of themselves, anybody thinks that they deserve more than somebody else, the message to us is, look, in humility, consider yourself as less important than others. Don't just think about your own needs, but think of the needs of others. And ultimately, that expression of that servant's heart and that humility leads to being able to do all things for one another. 
And Christ's ultimate expression of that is his humiliation brought the ultimate obedience to the point of death, even the death of the cross, it says. Back in the Garden of the Gethsemane, as he was facing his crucifixion, we see Christ overcome with fear. God himself, yet as a man experiencing fear, as he knew what was coming. And it says that he was under so much stress and, and worry over it, he sweat blood. That he cried out to the Father, please, if you were willing, remove this cup for me. Father, if there is any other way to save mankind without having to go die on the cross, please, let's do that. But then he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You see, the self-humiliation of Christ meant full obedience, total obedience, complete obedience, even to the point of death. And then it says, not just death, but then it makes a note there, even the death of the cross. You see, that's an important distinction. Because he didn't just die. He died the most humiliating death possible. You see, the cross at the time was the most degrading, demeaning experience one could endure. It was reserved for the worst criminals in society. Roman society considered mention of the cross, not the Christian cross, but the the cross that people were crucified on, they considered it a cuss word. They considered it an obscenity, the the mention of the cross. Some think that this can account for the fact that the the cross as a Christian symbol didn't really appear in the church until many, many years later. That because it was considered such an obscene word, that that might be why we didn't see it. I mean, after all, who would wear a cuss word as a necklace? And yet some people do that today, and they'll have cuss words as necklaces around their neck. And you look at them, you're like, how foul, how disgusting. How crude. Yet it says dying his death on the cross is where we saw Christ, the God of all creation, covered in shame and covered in disgrace in the eyes of man. That people walked by him hanging on the cross and looked up at him and were like, the shame that he was under as well as the anger and the wrath of God on sin. Truly Christ was the humblest man who has ever lived. And that is the example to us as Christians of humility. To lay aside everything we think we are, everything we think we deserve, to lay aside all of it, to esteem every other person around us as better than ourselves. The idea that I will, I will drop down, I will step down the corporate ladder in a sense, I will step down the, the whatever ladder of hierarchy of, of, of notoriety, to serve you. To be people who don't look at anybody and go, oh, you're so beneath me. Oh, that job is beneath me. But to say, I'm here to serve, and I'm here to serve my brothers and sisters, and I'm here to to lift them up. You know, my brother, years ago, um, my brother's a pastor too, and he came on staff here at Hosanna, and and it, it, it was always funny to me, but it was a very great lesson, is the very first day he came on staff, he got handed a plunger because the toilets in the bathroom had overflowed. Here you go. Welcome to staff. He had just graduated college, had his degree in biblical studies. Yes, and now I'm going into the, the world of ministry, and here you go. Pretty gross in there. Clean it up. And yet, to my brother's credit, he was like, okay, and joyfully cleaned it up. Wasn't necessarily enthusiastic about it, but he's like, hey, praise the Lord that I get to do this, that I get to serve here, that I get to, you know. And it was such a neat thing. But this exhortation that Paul is giving to us, that no matter who you are, no matter where you stand on the social ladder, no matter where you stand on the vocational ladder, no matter where you are in any hierarchy of authority, whether it's ministry or managerial or whatever, that you would never consider yourselves as more important, more blessed, more favored, more deserving, more worthy than anybody else. Because if the God of all things, perfect and holy and righteous, descended to the point of the most humiliating death on the cross, and he is our example as Christians, wow, how dare we elevate ourselves? How dare we? And so again, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but also the interests of others. 
this is the divine call for every single person in the body of Christ. This is the path. This is the, 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 the manual, if you will, of living a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And for those of you here tonight that do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Christ did this, condescended himself for you. He did it for you. He stepped out of heaven eternal and came to this earth in the likeness of a man and died this horrible death on the cross. The death that you and I should have died. He died that for you because he loved you beyond your comprehension. And when we think, oh, I, I've done nothing wrong. I'm a good person. You know, I mean, yeah, that's great. God did that for, you know, oh, my, my buddy. He really needs the death of Jesus because he's bad, but not me. You know, the Bible goes through all of this in such a clear way for us. When we think we're a good person, the Bible tells us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. There is none righteous, no, not one. And because God is holy and perfectly righteous and perfectly just, because he is light and in him is no darkness at all, no sin can dwell with him. And every single one of us are going to die. Every single one of us are going to come to our, the end of our life at some point. Whether it be through natural causes or some tragedy, we don't know. And because God, who exists outside of time, knew that was going to happen, he came into time to deal with the problem that you and I have sinned against God and broken his law. And because we've broken his law, we stand in the path of his judgment. Because he is just. He can't just pretend we didn't do what we've done. He had to mete out the penalty of sin, which is death, according to the Bible. And that is why he came. And when we start to think, well, no, that's not for me. I'm a good person. We just have to look at God's list. God gave us the Ten Commandments to say, look, do you really think you're a good person? Have you ever told a lie? Well, little ones. Well, then you're a liar. Good people don't lie. Have you ever stolen anything? regardless of the value? Well, you know, I took a paper clip from work. It wasn't your paper clip. You're a thief. Jesus said, if you look on a woman with lust, and this applies both ways, ladies, if you look on a man with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. And I think every single one of us have done that. And he goes, well, then you're an adulterer. And you're going to have the audacity to say you're a good person? When out of your own mouth you've admitted to be a lying, thieving adulterer? And that's just three of the Ten Commandments. And when we face that and we realize, oh my gosh, I have no hope. I have, I, there's no way I could save myself. I can't do enough good works because no matter how many good works I do, there's always double the amount of bad works behind it. Whether it's selfish action, selfish thought, it's in our nature to be selfish. And that's why we have these instructions in Scripture to say, look, it is only through Christ and because of Christ, according to his example and him living within you, that you can even possibly live in a way that glorifies God. Sin really is that big of a deal. So big of a deal that God himself, perfect, guilty of nothing, came to this earth, lived a perfect life, died your death on the cross, a torturous, horrific, painful death. And he did it for you so that the justice of God could be satisfied and yet he can extend forgiveness to you and I. The humility in all of that is amazing. And how do you receive the benefit of his work? Well, the Bible simply says, if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, you need to repent. You don't receive the benefit of what he did for you just because. Yes, he did die for the whole world. He died to pay the price for every human that, that has ever and will ever exist. But you don't enjoy the benefits of that salvation until you receive it. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You have to receive the free gift of salvation that God offers you. You have to surrender your life to his lordship. It's not just being sorry you got caught. It's being truly, godly, 
having godly sorrow that results in a change of heart, a change of mind, and a change of person. So let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for tonight. We thank you for your word. We thank you for what you did for us, God, the example that you, the perfect creator of all things, without sin, without blemish, would come to this earth to die in our place. That, God, you would look onto this little tiny speck of dirt called earth, and you would see us, Lord, a privileged planet full of sinful people. That, God, when we look around and we ask questions like, God, why is there evil? Lord, it's because of us. It's because of our selfishness. It's because of our breaking your law and serving ourselves and trying to please ourselves and hurting one another. And that yet, God, in your perfect love, you don't force any one of us to serve you. You don't force any one of us to believe in you. But through the gift of our free will, Lord, you ask us to make a choice. And so while we're praying and heads bowed, eyes closed, if you're in this room and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you right now where you're seated just to raise your hand and say, yes, I want to accept Christ as my Savior tonight. I know I have sinned against him and I know I need him. I know I need forgiveness. And the Bible guarantees this as a promise. It's just simply acknowledging what he did for you confessing your sin, and receiving him as your Lord. And the Bible says if you do this, you are saved. There is no person in this world that is guaranteed tomorrow. And if you don't know him tonight, you need to get right with him right now. God did everything he did for you so that you would have this opportunity right now. And if you pass this opportunity, you will never be able to say, God, you didn't give me a chance. And so if you want to receive him tonight and be forgiven of your sins, just raise your hand where you're seated and I will pray with you. Father, we thank you, God. We thank you, God, for who you are and what you've done. Lord, we know that your word says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, God. And I pray for anybody in this room, Lord, that needs to do that, that they would do that right now. And God, for the rest of us as believers, as your kids, those that have received salvation, Lord, may we walk according to your example. May we be humble as you were humble. Lord, may we be people who are willing and ready to give up everything to serve one another. That, God, we would know that we deserve nothing because we are guilty criminal sinners. And yet, because of your grace and your love, God, we have the opportunity to not only be forgiven, but to live lives that glorify you and to take this message to those that don't have it. And so God, give us opportunity to serve one another, to serve in our churches, to serve wherever we're at, God. In an attitude that is the same attitude you had, the same attitude that caused you, God of all eternity, to come into this world, to live on this earth, to die on the cross and to raise from the dead that we would have the opportunity to be forgiven. Lord, may we share that with everybody we come in contact to far and wide, Lord. And may we do it through every opportunity you give us, whether it's through tracks, whether it's through a Halloween maze or handing out candy at our door. Lord, whether it's through our job, our, our hobbies, whatever it may be, God, give us those opportunities and give us the boldness to step through and preach the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, when the end of all things comes and we stand before you, Lord, may we stand before you knowing that you're going to look upon us as we live lives worthy of the gospel and saying, well done, good and faithful servants. Lord, we love you so much. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.